Okay, welcome everyone. Um, what's on the board here is not the topic of today's lecture. You may be glad to hear, uh, or you may have been here uh, half an hour ago to, to see this. <clears throat> uh, I'll start the usual way. We have a couple of minutes before, I don't even know what the official start class time is, but uh, we have a couple of minutes to take on uh, any questions if anybody wants to ask some. Uh, question for part ten of assignment one, can we use collections dot max? Uh, you can. You're allowed. Um, you may or may not be able to get a fast enough solution uh, that way. Um, <clears throat> so I know that there are some people who's uh, who have solutions that are not uh, necessarily that fast, but they manage to squeak through the. The, the server's tests. Um, so think of something other than iterating through the entire collection looking for the, the maximum. Um, and in particular, think of not doing that repeatedly. <clears throat> uh, my guess is that collections.max is not any faster than uh, whatever it is you, uh, you implement. I mean, collections.max, uh, you could probably look at the code. It's, uh, it's, my guess is it's just a for loop for, for x in, uh, in the collection c. Um, compare x to some, some value m. It's not, uh, not difficult. Okay, so I'm seeing 21 seconds of latency um, at my end. And at least that takes 21 seconds from the time I do something for it to make it uh, to YouTube and back to, uh, back to this tablet. So I'm guessing it's, uh, it's not going to be a super interactive class today. Um, but still, I'll try and ask questions and then do something else and come back to, to see the, the answers that, uh, that you guys have given me. Um, so today we're actually going to see a, a very cool data structure. <clears throat> uh, it's, a, it's another list implementation, and it uses arrays, but it's, it's different from all the other ones. Um, and it's motivated by uh, this idea of wanting to use 
space as efficiently as possible. Okay. So uh, there's this notion that we have. Uh, it's not so critical in Java uh, because Java is just bad uh, at using memory uh, in general, and it's unavoidably so. Uh, but in other languages, it's it's really important, uh, or can be really important. And it's this notion of wasted space. And for us, I'll say that uh, wasted space is any memory location that's not being used to store uh, some data item. And if a data item, the same data item, is stored in more than uh, one memory location, then I'll let you say the first one is uh, not wasted space, but the other ones are wasted space. So you can't cheat by uh, taking one data item and storing it a bunch of times and saying, look, I'm not wasting space, I'm storing all only data. Um, it's really uh, anything more, any more space than you need to store the data that you have. So let's look at a, a couple of examples. Um, <clears throat> so we have seen uh, several list implementations based on arrays. We saw the uh, array stack, which is the Java Collections Framework array list. And we saw uh, array uh, deck and even the, uh, dual, uh, the, the dual array deck, which is just two of these, these array stacks. So where is the wasted space in those implementations? Well, if we look at an array stack, uh, the picture of it usually looks like this. So there's an integer n that keeps track of the number of elements in the list. So that is not data that's being stored in the data structure. So this is wasted space. This is one integer. It uses one unit of memory. So there's one unit of wasted space. <clears throat> um, there's also an array, and to keep track of that array, you need a pointer. So in our uh, array stack class, there's an instance variable called a, which points to, uh, is a reference to, an array somewhere in memory. Okay. So this thing here is wasted space. So this is one unit, and a pointer is also one unit of wasted space. And then there's the array itself. Okay. <clears throat> so, and in general, um, some of these array locations have stuff in them. I've marked those with X's here. And then some of them are empty, because Usually, the array is bigger than the number of elements that it's storing. In our code, that's a dot length is the length of the array, and n is the number of elements in the, the structure. So these things here, each one of them is a unit of wasted space. Okay. Uh, so, a few questions. The submission server is indeed the only place that you need to submit your assignment. Um, submit it to the submission server. Uh, it gets backed up regularly. Uh, all the grades are uh, saved and, in fact, everything that goes there is saved. Um, those grades will get uploaded to see you learn at some point. Um, but you, you have a record of them, so don't, don't panic if you don't see your grade there one minute after the assignment is due. <clears throat> Um, so this is, uh, this is wasted uh, space. So the, the, the places in this array where there's no data, we call that wasted space. <clears throat> and actually, um, this can be a lot, right? So this is just a, one unit, this is just one unit. But we've even seen examples in an array stack where the thing gets 
the first third is full, but the second two thirds are empty. That's sort of the extreme case, just before you would resize to make it smaller. Um, and so that means if this is n, then here there is 2n units of wasted space. Uh, and more common, this is kind of a rare thing when the thing is shrinking, but it's not uncommon at all. In fact, it happens every time you do a resize to have uh, n units of wasted space. So if you think about this, this means that, <clears throat> you know, if you bought a laptop or a computer recently, one of the decisions you have to make is how much RAM that you, you put in this thing. And uh, especially if you buy laptops, um, RAM is uh, ridiculously, uh, adds ridiculously uh, too much to the cost of the, the laptop in comparison to what it costs to actually uh, manufacture and install in a, in a laptop. Um, but this, this really here means that, uh, you know, if I have a, an eight gigabyte uh, laptop, well, I can only reliably work with four gigabytes of data because otherwise there's a chance that some list gets allocated that's actually uh, more than eight gigabytes because it needs to store five gigabytes, so it allocates a list of ten gigabytes, which doesn't fit in RAM. Um, then maybe the thing starts thrashing or, or maybe it fails, but it really means that you uh, you had to pay for twice as much, just to be safe, you had to pay for twice as much memory as you're probably actually ever going to use. Okay, so it seems like something we'd, we'd want to avoid. Um, it's not, not critical all the time and not critical for every application, but you can imagine there are some really demanding data processing tasks where you really would like to use all of your available RAM for storing your data, not for, uh, not for storing empty arrays. Okay, so there's one example, um, and here's another example. Uh, we haven't discussed them in great detail, but we have seen linked lists. So linked lists store the data in the nodes, and the nodes store, in the case of uh, the linked list in the Java Collections framework. It's a doubly linked list. Um, they do this kind of picture looks like this. So depending on the implementation, there may or may not be a dummy node. Uh, the dummy node, of course, it's not storing any data, so it's wasted space. And it's probably, you would count this as three units, because there's uh, a reference here, a reference here, and room for a data item, but it's not actually storing one. Um, and these things here, well, what's actually in the data in there uh, is not wasted space, but those two pointers to the next node and the previous node, all of those things, wasted space. Okay. So although array lists look kind of bad because they frequently use arrays that are twice as big as necessary, um, linked lists, and in particular doubly linked lists, can also be uh, very bad because uh, well, they, for every data item that they have, useful space, there are two pointers, um, wasted space, okay? So they're always wasting, if we make a rough accounting, twice as much, uh, they're wasting 2n units of, uh, of space just for these, uh, these pointers linking things back and, uh, back and forth, okay? So we'd like to uh, see if there's a list implementation that supports the main list operations, add, remove, get, and set, 
that doesn't have this problem of wasting so much space. So we'll just make a note that all list implementations implementations so far waste and I will just say uh, omega n units of space and I'll put in parentheses sometimes Sometimes you get lucky in an array list and you happen to fill it up without going past the end and then you're not wasting any space at all. Of course, on the way to getting to that stage, you probably were wasting space, but maybe by the time you reach that, you're not wasting space. So at some point they're wasting space, not necessarily all the time. And the amount that they're wasting is proportional to the number of items that they're storing uh, at that, that time. Okay, <clears throat> so we're going to look at an implementation uh, today called the rootish array stack, which avoids this. And it will only use, so it's called the rootish array stack. And if you were here, um, half an hour ago, for, or 45 minutes ago now, for the previous class, square roots kept showing up in that class, and they're going to show up uh, here. So, uh, probably the first time I teach two classes on the same day um, about computer science, where square roots keep, uh, keep showing up. Uh, so, rootish array stack in, in two totally different contexts. Um, so, it's a list implementation. with only uh, O of root and wasted space. Right, and just, just remember, uh, you know, for instance, uh, just as an example, if n is a 1 million, then 2n, which is like what a uh, link list wastes is about two million, but root n is only a thousand. Okay. So this thing, if it really manages to only waste this root n space, it means that that wasted space is nothing, absolutely nothing, compared to the amount of data that it's storing. Right. When n is a million, the amount of wasted space is a thousand times less than the actual data that's being stored. Uh, whereas this is twice as much as the actual uh, data that's being stored. Okay. So, how does a rootish array stack work? <clears throat> well, it, uh, it uses a collection of arrays. So, rather than store things in a single array, It uses an array called, uh, I think it's called blocks. So it's a list. And each of the things in there is a reference to an array. Okay. Now, just like this picture shows, the first array, so the one that you would get if you go to blocks at position 0, just has length 1. But the second one has length 2, the third one has length 3, uh, the fourth one has length 4, the fifth one has length uh, 5, and so on. Okay? So, that's... Uh, that's the way it looks. There's this thing called blocks, 
Uh, blocks is just a list. Uh, and let's, just to be precise or pick something, let's say blocks is an array stack. That's good enough for us. So we know array stacks waste space, and, uh, but the amount of space that, it, that is wasted by an array stack is proportional to the number of items it's storing. And in this case, the items in here, they're not list items, they're these blocks. So what we have to worry about is the number of blocks we have because that's how much space is going to get wasted here. Um, now, within the blocks, this is where the data goes. And the list indices are like you would expect. Uh, if I want list item uh, 0, then I should go to block 0 and take item 0. And if I want list item 1, I should go to block 1, item 0. If I want list item 2, well, that one I can go to block 1 and take item 1. Okay. So, this is where the things live. This is where stuff lives. And, you know, there's as many of these as you need. So I'll put some dots here to indicate that maybe there's more than you expected. And the number of these things will use the, the notation that the, the number of these is, blah, is r. So r is equal to the number of blocks. Okay. That is just equal to, if you like, that's blocks dot size. And we'll always make sure that, um, and so, you know, it's a list, so things are occupied starting at position 0, going up to n, the length of the list. And we'll always make sure that that always puts at least one item in the last two blocks. Okay. So always at least one item in the last two blocks. All right. So there's never more, there's never two fully empty blocks. So maybe this block is empty. Um, that's bad for us. That's wasted space. Maybe this block is almost completely empty, but it has at least one element in it. And all the other blocks are completely full. Okay. So, does every block have a certain length? Yes, the blocks have length 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. So the first block has length 1, the second block has length 2, the third one has length 3, and so on. Okay. So let's ask a, a very basic question here. If r is equal to blocks.length, How many list items can we store? Okay, so that's the question. The answer is, well, if there's R blocks, the first one has length 1, uh, has size 1, the second one has size 2, the third one has size 3, the next one has size 4, all the way up to the final one, which has size R. So, 
What does all of that add up to? Some of you may know this, some of you not. Um, my guess is a good chunk of you will uh, know this but be off by one. Um, you'll think it's r times r minus one over two. It's actually r times r plus one over two. And I'll teach you a trick now so that you never have to, uh, to forget this again. The story goes, and the story comes with it, um, the story goes that Gauss, the famous mathematician, discovered this trick when he was nine years old uh, as a schoolboy and discovered it in a sort of a fraction of a second when his school uh, teacher, his mathematics teacher, uh, got tired of uh, teaching and I guess wanted to have a, a cigarette or something. Um, and he gave the kids, the nine-year-old kids, uh, the exercise of adding up all the numbers 1 through 100. So all the integers 1 through 100. He figured he'd have some time to take a break, but before uh, he finished uh, writing the question on the board, uh, Gauss put up his hand and told him the answer was 5,050. Um, which is remarkable uh, for a nine-year-old. Maybe it's a true story, maybe it's not, but it's a, it's a good story anyway. Uh, but Gauss didn't do this by doing the long addition that the teacher expected people to, to do. Uh, he discovered this trick. Um, it has a nice geometric interpretation. In fact, we can almost see the picture here. Uh, here's what you're trying to count. So what Gauss's teacher wanted him to count was how many squares are in this picture. Except the picture was bigger. The picture had uh, 100 rows in it, right? There's the 1, there's the 2, there's the 3, there's the 4, there's the 5, all the way up to 100. And, well, that means that the last one was of size 100, so uh, that means that that's R as well. And here's the cool trick. <clears throat> you just take this picture and make a copy of it, except you uh, rotate the copy 180 degrees so that the two pieces fit together. So this one square up here in the copy is one square down here. This two squares here in the copy is those two squares there. The three squares here in the copy is these th three squares there. Okay. So now there's the black blocks, which you're trying to count, and there's the red blocks, which you just introduced. You're not interested in counting them. But there's the same number of black blocks and red blocks. And actually, the total number is easy to count. Why is that? Well, this is a rectangle. Its height is r, and its width is r plus 1. Okay. So the total number of blocks in there is r times r plus 1 in this picture. That's the total number of blocks. And half of them are black. So the number of black blocks is r times r plus 1 over 2. So that's the, that's the way you can always remember this formula now. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so you can define the length of the block when declaring the Rudish array stack. Well, the Rudish array stack in its implementation, if it needs to make a new block, if it needs to add a block, it adds one whose length is exactly uh, the length that it should be. So um, if it's the block, if it's the ith block, then it will have length, uh, length i. So, um, so if this is the, the number of blocks you have, r, then the amount of data that you can store is exactly this. Okay. 
and this is kind of um, important. Um, and you may see where square roots are coming from now, uh, because uh, this thing here is r squared plus uh, r uh, divided by 2. And so if I turn the question around and said, I have n data items, how many blocks do I need? Well, then I'm trying to solve something like r squared plus r over 2 uh, is equal to n. That's a quadratic equation in the variable r. Um, so the answer is going to have a square root in it. OK. Uh, all right, so I've laid out the structure. I've told you what, uh, what it does. So now we just need to look at the, the details of some of the, the operations. Remember they are add, uh, remove, get, and set. And usually with these array-based implementations, we did get and set first because they were easy. Um, they were the easiest things. Actually, uh, here, they're probably the hardest thing in this data structure. Um, so better, better that we start with the add operation. Okay, so we have an array stack, uh, a rootish array stack. It looks like this. Uh, we would like to add something to it. Okay. So um, I should maybe point out, like most of our data structures, this thing has uh, also an integer n that keeps track of the, the size. So uh, let's see how we could add to this thing. In fact, uh, here's where we can punt and avoid, uh, avoid dealing with, uh, with the difficult questions just yet. But let's say we do something like, well, since we're adding, we should increase the value of n. And if the value of n has increased, then we can just say, let's set position n minus 1 to x. That's an add, right? Add means make the list longer and set the last element in the list. Oh, sorry, not i. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That's just, that's appending. Um, well, let me, uh, let me do that. The very simple add operation, which is just append, uh, we can just do n plus plus and set n minus 1 to x. So that's the append operation. Uh, and the more general add operation, where you have to add at a specific location, well, that we've also uh, kind of seen. It's a little more complicated. Uh, but we're also going to increase the value of n, and then we're going to do something like 4 integer j is equal to, uh, I guess it would be n minus 2 j is bigger than or equal to i, j minus minus, and what we do is we set position, the array element at position j plus 1 to the array element at position j. So this is the shifting And then finally, we set the item at position i to x. So uh, this is the easy version where you just want to add to the end. This is the, the full version where you want to insert at a specific position i. First, you have to shift everything from i onwards right by one position. And then you can set the value at, uh, at i equal to 
to x. Um, of course, we have to be a bit careful here because, well, just setting, increasing the value of n doesn't necessarily mean that we have enough room in our array. Uh, it doesn't mean that we have enough room in these blocks because we could actually be at a situation where the blocks are all full, in which case increasing the value of n uh, means that, and then trying to set something, means we're trying to set some value that's not there. So we should check for that. And what does that check look like? Well, what we would like to know is if n plus 1, which is how many elements we're going to have after we add this one, if that's bigger than the maximum number of elements that I can store, then I have a problem. Uh, I need to make more room. So if that's bigger than r times r plus 1 divided by 2, then we need to do something. And I'll say we call a function called grow. So if I want to add, but I'm going to have, after I add, I'll have more elements than I could possibly store in these R blocks, then before I do the add, I grow. Once I've done that, I know that there's space, I can increase the value of n, do the shifting, and then set this thing. And what does grow look like? It's really simple. So it just does something like um, R plus plus. So we're going to add a new block. our list of blocks. So remember the one argument uh, function add, the one that doesn't take a, a value i, just appends to the end of the list. And that's what we want to do here. We want to add to the, a new block to the end. Uh, a new array. Uh, and the length of that array should be uh, r. So we had a new array whose length is equal to uh, the new number of blocks. So after we do that, the uh, if after we do that, there's a whole empty block here at the end, and we we're free to to do this. Okay. <clears throat> so any quick questions there? Uh, why j equals n minus 2? Um, uh, because we've already increased the value of n, so at position n minus 1 is an empty slot. Um, so at position n minus 1 is an empty slot. So we want to take the thing at position n minus 2 and move it to n minus 1. So we start at n minus 2, we move it to n minus 1. And next up, we take the thing at position n minus 3 and move it to n minus 2. So that's why we start, start at n minus 2. Um, <clears throat> all the way down to the last thing we move is the thing at position i, and we move it to position i plus 1. Okay, so that's the, the add operation. Um, and there's not too much to say about it. We've kind of seen what this looks like. Uh, in terms of running time, uh, the expensive thing is this, O of n minus i. Uh, then there's this grow operation, which uh, allocates a new block if it happens. Um, and I, I will 
just for now, ignore this. Say that uh, this runs in constant time. Actually, how long it runs really depends on the programming language and the environment that you have. Uh, in Java, when you allocate a new array, uh, it actually takes time proportional to the length of the, uh, the array. So it would be O of R time. Um, and we'll account for that at the end of the class anyway. Whether this runs in constant time or O of R time, uh, it doesn't really, uh, doesn't really make a difference because it doesn't run very often. Um, but the, the point is, this looks like what we're used to for things like array stacks. There's, you have to shift n minus i things and then do uh, a constant amount of work. So uh, we'll maybe keep track of, uh, of that right here. Add i x, this is O of 1 plus n minus i. We've seen that running time lots of times before. All right. Let's look at the remove operation. And for this one, we can also leave all the hard work to get and set. Um, because all we have to do is, uh, remember when we remove, we need to take the elements at positions i plus 1 up to n minus 1 and shift them left one position so that they fill in the gap left when we remove item i. So that looks something like uh, for j is equal to i j is a less than n minus 1, j plus plus, and what we do is we set the thing at position j to the value that is stored at position j plus 1. So we take the thing at position j plus 1 and we move it to position j or we set it to position j, because it's about to get overwritten by the thing at position j plus 2. We do that all the way up to the, to the end, so the last thing we take is at position n minus 1. Uh, we do that. Uh, now the item at position i has been overwritten, so probably we need to save it. At the end, we need to return it. And uh, what else is there to do? I guess we should decrease n because we've just removed something from the list. Anything else that we need to do here? TR is generic class. T is always the, the stand-in for the type of objects that we happen to be storing in our list. So um, you see this in the source code everywhere. There's these variables of type t. t just means, uh, and it, it appears in the class uh, declaration as the generic parameter, uh, which is just the, the type of things we happen to be storing in our, our list. Um, OK, so we're almost done with remove. The only issue is. Uh, I promised you that uh, this thing would never have two empty blocks at the end. Okay. So, as the code stands now, there's nothing happens to these. There's no adjusting the blocks. None of the blocks are ever deleted. So, if I filled one of these things up, it could have lots of blocks, and then I started removing everything. Uh, there'd be lots of blocks left around. That would be wasting space. So we need to just look out for this last situation where uh, I do a remove. The last array was already empty. The second last array was nearly empty, it had only one element in it, and now that I've removed things, that element disappears. Okay. 
So what does that mean? <clears throat> well, if that happens, that means right at this point, after I've done the remove uh, and decreased the, the value of n so that it now reflects the, the current number of elements in my list, um, I need to check, could I have stored all of those n items using two fewer blocks? Okay. So, what does that check look like? So, if instead of having r blocks, what if I only had r minus 2? Would that be enough to store n items? If so, then that means I should get rid of one of these blocks here because it means I'm wasting two of them completely because the n items can all fit actually in these first, uh, these first r minus 2 blocks. Okay? So, uh, the check then is if n is less than or equal to, will it fit in r minus 2 blocks? So if I take this thing and I add it up, but only add up to r minus 2 instead of all the way up to r, then this becomes an r minus 2, this becomes an r minus 1. So if that's less than or equal to uh, r minus 2 times r minus 1, then we won't grow, we'll shrink. All right, and what does shrink do? Shrink is easy. It just does uh, blocks.remove blocks.size minus 1. And you decrease the value of r. Now, r actually is unnecessary. It's, r is always just basically blocks size, um, but we keep it here because it makes nicer formulas. Um, so that's what shrink does. So if we, if we did just remove the last element from this second last array, then shrink will remove this thing and off goes this array. The garbage collector will come and clean it up. Now we don't have two empty arrays at the end, we have only one. Good. Um, so yes, given the lag, someone suggested that we should uh, do this, check to see if we need to remove a block, and that's what we do. Okay. So add and remove, um, they, they guarantee now, so add was never a concern, we were never worried that uh, add would create an empty block, but it sometimes needs to create a new block. Um, or we're never worried about uh, having empty blocks because of add, but sometimes it needs to create a new block. With remove, we need to worry about not leaving uh, too many empty blocks. We've taken care of that. Uh, the running time of remove, we, we've seen it uh, before. It's all in here, right? It's all in the shifting of elements. So this is something like um, n minus i elements that we have to shift. So remove, it runs in O of 1 plus n minus i time. Uh, and the shrink operation, uh, I mean, here you remove the last block. That means that there's an array that gets cleaned up by the garbage collector. How much time that that takes, again, depends on exactly the system that you, you have. Um, but it's, it's not more than the length of the array that you're, you're removing. Okay. So we'll, uh, we, we won't worry about that for, for now. Uh, all right, so that's how add and remove work. Why not r minus 2 times r minus 1 over 2? You're absolutely right. Uh, the formula should be divided by 2. Forgot the, the division by 2 here. 
Okay. So then what is, uh, what's left? Uh, just get and set. And we've been using them here, so we better make sure that we, we get them right. So we want to go, let's say for the get method, we want to get the item at list index i. So for example, um, if we wanted to get the item at list index uh, 8, so that's this one here, then That means that I want to go to block whose index is 3, that's there, and I'm within that block I want to get, so within this array I want to get the thing at position 2. So this shows us that we're actually going to need two numbers here. You give me i, and I need to figure out which block to go to, we'll call that B, uh, and then within that block I need to figure out uh, which uh, index to go to inside that array. So let's uh, avoid the hard work for as long as possible and say We'll later, we'll put this off, hopefully someone will figure, we'll do this for us. Um, we'll wait as long as possible to uh, figure out how to find the right block. We'll write a function called, that takes i and gives me the, the block index. Okay. So in this case, uh, if I said i to be uh, 8, so give me 8, that should return. 0, 1, 2, 3. All right. <clears throat> and then we want to know the second thing, which is the index uh, inside this array uh, that we should, we should get the element that we, we want. In this case, it's 2. Okay. So that one maybe we can figure out. we can just use our, our reasoning here. All right. <clears throat> so, um, I already know that I'm going to block B. So that's this block, uh, block with index B. That's block with index uh, 3 here. So, we have zero-based indexing. So that means that the number of blocks that come before this one, in this case, it's three. And actually, in general, the number of items that come before the element at list index i is i. Or the number of items that come before the element at list index b is b. Now, we know how many uh, or we can calculate how many items are in all of these uh, B lists, right? So there's B lists here, and then there's the one that we've, we're going to actually look into. So let's figure out how many of these things, uh, how many things come before this. Well, we're going to have B times B plus 1 over 2. That's how many things came before this, right? So here, 3 times 4, so b is 3, 3 times 4 is 12, divided by 2 is 6, and indeed there are 6 elements here. Okay. Now, that means that the index of this thing, the, the 
first element of this array is 6, because there's 6 things that come before it. So that means the index of the first thing in this array is, uh, is this number that we just computed, b times b plus 1 over 2. Now, why did we want position 2? Well, that's because we wanted array index 8 minus the index of the first thing in this array, which is 6. So this 2 here, in general, is just i minus that thing. So now I have the two indices I need. One is the index of the block, and the other is the index within the block. And I just do a return. Uh, this is going to be blocks dot get b. That gives me an array at position j. So there's what the get method looks like, minus the fact that we have ignored uh, this, uh, this i to b thing. So we haven't done that yet. And the set method, uh, you can figure it out. It's a similar thing. It has to compute b. It has to compute j. It has to get the block that has the array, that has the index we want. And then rather than just return it, it has to set the value there, or save the value there, set it, and, and return it. We've seen how that, that works. Um, the, the tricky bit here is the, the b and the j part. So. Uh, Finally, the last thing, this i to b. How the heck are we going to, uh, to find this thing? Uh, well, how do we find this, this b? Uh, so we know that... Um, so let's look at the first, uh, so the, the blocks with indices 0 through b. So we have the block with index 0, the block with index 1, the block with index 2, and so on, all the way up to the block that we want. Okay. This is b plus 1 blocks, right? Zero, we're counting from 0 to b. There's b plus 1 of those things. So that means the amount of list locations that are in there are uh, b plus 1 times b plus 2 over 2. So that's how many list locations that there are. Okay. Um, good. Now, those things have list indices which go start at 0, 1, 2, and go all the way up to this number. So that's that thing there. b plus 1 times b minus 2, b plus 2 over 2 minus 1. Okay. Those are the list indices that are available in those first b plus 1 blocks. Now, I need that thing. I'm looking for, I'm hoping that, you know, I want that uh, the index i to be in this, this list, this block number b. So I need this quantity here to be bigger than or equal to i. If it's not, that means i is further down. Okay? And on the other hand, if there's a smaller value of b for which it's bigger than or equal to i, that means i is, is in one of the lists higher up. 
So I really what I want is the minimum B such that B plus 1 times B plus 2 over 2 minus 1 is bigger than or equal to I. If I find that, that's the block B that I need. Now, um, that's a bit annoying. Uh, I don't want to have to use a for loop or something to do this. Remember, this is for the get method, and we want this to run uh, as fast as possible. So instead, I'll just solve this equation. Okay. Solve that equation. What do you get? <clears throat> Well, you get some, uh, so, so this equation is a, a quadratic equation. Uh, it's equivalent to, if I rewrite it carefully, I get a b squared minus 3b uh, minus 2i is equal to 0. And if I solve it, Uh, using the quadratic formula, I get b is equal to minus 3 plus the square root of 9 plus 8i divided by 2. So if I use the quadratic formula, I actually get two solutions. Um, this one and the other one is negative. So the negative one doesn't make any sense because it would tell me that I should be going to a block with the negative index. This is the, the solution that, that matters to, to me. Um, so I solve this, this equation. I get some value b. And in general, b is not an integer, right? This, this does not look like an integer at all. So in this case, you know, here, for example, if I solve that equation for uh, i is equal to 8, I get some number that is like uh, 2 point something, right? Yeah, I get some number like 2 point something, something bigger than, uh, than 2 because I didn't really need the full block to get what I wanted. I only need a, a part of it, but I actually need an integer answer here. So in the end, the formula for the block is you take this thing and you take its ceiling. So now rather than uh, write the code for that, on the board, we'll just quickly scan through the, the precise pseudocode. Okay, um, I hope you can see me and uh, and hear hear me. Uh, so here's the the actual class code for this. It's the Rudish Array Stack class. It's uh, available in the sources that come with the, the textbook. Here is the list of blocks. See, it's a list of arrays of type T. There's the integer n. And I mentioned already that you don't actually need this variable r because it's just the length of this, this list. Um, and here is this i to b method. So it computes uh, a real valued solution to this equation. It uses that formula that I showed, um, minus 3 plus the square root of 9 plus 8 times i over 2. And then it takes the ceiling of that uh, and returns that. Okay. Uh, then the get method is exactly what I showed, uh, except I didn't bother with bounds checking. You compute the value of b, you compute the value of j, and uh, you uh, you return get b at uh, you you go to block b that's what this does that's an array and you get it at position j set does exactly the same uh, 
thing, except uh, it first saves the value that it finds there, uh, then it sets the value, and then it returns the saved value. And the add and grow operations are exactly, uh, I think, almost exactly what we, we did. Um, maybe I incremented n beforehand, uh, but whatever, it's the equivalent type of code. Uh, yeah, you check if the, if the thing is about to overflow. If so, you grow it, and then increase the value of n and do the gets and do the shifting, finally set it. Uh, if you need to grow, this is all you do is you allocate a new array of size r plus 1 uh, at, the, at the end and, and append it to your, uh, your list of blocks. Um, and that increases the value of r because r is just the length of the list of blocks. And then finally, remove, uh, same thing. There's bounds checking. You save the value you're, you're going to remove. Do the shifting. Uh, reduce n, check if, uh, if you have two empty blocks at the end, and if so, then you shrink, and then return the saved value. And the shrink here is a little bit more than I said, and that's because uh, it also gets called by uh, um, functions that remove a whole bunch of elements at once. Um, so basically, uh, shrink will keep removing things uh, as long as there's two empty blocks at the end. So there's a while loop to, to do that. Um, if it was only ever called here, then it could uh, just always remove the, the single block, but there's actually other places in the code that, that more than one element gets removed. Uh, okay, and so that's the, that's the whole uh, Rudish Array Stack class. Um, the, the thing that initializes it just sets n to zero. Uh, makes blocks a new array list to store those um, that list of blocks. Um, this is some annoying Java, uh, some problematic stuff that uh, that has to do with creating arrays of generics in in Java. I don't really want to uh, to get into the the details. It's a kind of a problem that Java created for it itself. Okay, uh, good. So. Nothing, I don't think I was hiding anything really in the, the, the code there. All right. Um, <clears throat> so, what's left to, to do? Well, we can write out our theorem. about this rootish array stack, uh, which is just that a rootish array stack implements the list interface uh, get i and set i x run in constant time add i x and remove i run in o of 1 plus n minus i time I'm going to put a star here uh, that star is Ignoring the cost of grow and shrink. And I'll explain why we ignore that in a couple of minutes. Uh, and uh, the rootish array stack never has more than O of 
of a square root n units of a wasted space. Okay. So we haven't proved that yet. We'll see why that happens. But I think maybe you're seeing where it comes from. Um, where is the wasted space in this thing? Well, this here is definitely all wasted space. This is all wasted space. And there's these two things at the end that are also wasted space. Okay. So I need to argue that somehow this is proportional to root n, the square root of the number of elements in the list. And this is also proportional to the square root of the number of elements in the list. Okay. Now, why is that? Well, that's because we've maintained this, uh, that r minus 1 times, or sorry, r minus 2 times r minus 1 over 2 is less than or equal to n. Okay. Where is this? Well, we actually saw this when we did the shrinking. Um, this is what triggers us to shrink the array uh, because it's basically this is this tells us that we have two empty blocks at the end. We we remove uh, one of them so that this is no longer true. And if we rewrite this, uh, or solve this, rather, uh, for r, that means r is less than 1 half 3 plus the square root of 8n plus 1. So what's the only thing in here that's not a constant? It's the n, and the n is under a square root. So this is actually order root n. So r, the number of blocks, is definitely on the order of root n. And where is our wasted space? Well, here we have a block of length r, or a, and a list of length r that's all wasted space. But r is root n, so this is only order root n wasted space. Uh, the last uh, array we here have here, the last block, which may be all wasted space, is only of length r, which is on the order of root n, so that's wasted. And the second last block is only of length r minus 1, which is uh, potentially all wasted space, but that's only order root n. So order root n plus order root n plus order root n, it's only on the order of square root n wasted space. Um, so that's where where this happens. Okay. And this happens because we guarantee that the number of blocks uh, satisfies this thing, that we could not have had two fewer blocks and still had things work out. Okay. Um, and then the last thing I want to explain is why I ignored the cost of grow and shrink and why uh, you may have had a question when I did the shrinking which is, if I have two empty blocks at the end, why, why only delete one of them? So, and I'll just do this very quickly because you've seen the idea at least twice now. But imagine that, like in Java, Allocating an array of length r takes time proportional to r. In Java, it does because it actually goes through the array and sets all its r entries to, to null. Um, <clears throat> but let's look at, uh, we have one of these rootish array stacks. This is the supposed to represent the, the list of blocks. Um, and now imagine it's completely full. 
we call add and we need to uh, allocate a, a new array. So we do that and it allocates an array of length r. And right now that array is completely uh, empty. Okay. So remember we were always looking, uh, we always did this trick of um, when we need to do an allocation, what, when is the last time, we, when we needed to rebalance or when we needed to resize, when is the last time we, we needed to, to do that? How much time has elapsed since then? Well, let's turn, this, turn it around just a little bit and look forward. Um, I just allocated this array. It's a length r. It's completely empty. It took me uh, maybe order r time to allocate this thing and set all its, its entries to, to zero. How long is it going to have to be before I allocate another one or before I have to remove this one? Well, uh, before I have to allocate another one of these things, this has to come completely full. right? So that means I have to add, you know, if I need to grow, the next time I need to grow, it's because I've added an additional r minus 1 things to make it, to, to fill this up. So, so that says, you know, the next time I grow, uh, there has been at least R uh, in additions since I, I did this. Um, so, so that's the, the trick that we always use. If you do a work that takes order R time, then just show me that there were at least R steps since the last time you did that kind of work. Okay? So that's what's, uh, what does it here. Um, and now, how long will it have to be before I shrink this array, before I have to get rid of it? Well, I won't have to get rid of it until... So it's, it's already empty, um, and I won't have to get rid of it until I empty this whole one, the one that came just before it, but this whole one is completely full. So before I just allocated this, it took order R time, um, but it's going to stick around either until I add r minus 1 elements or I delete r minus 1 elements. Okay. So, um, so basically in either case, uh, even, if, even if removing an array takes order r time, if, if uh, let's say freeing an array of length r takes order r time, uh, you still have the, the, the gaps in, in between these uh, these order our operations happen in between these, these things. Um, and I mentioned, maybe you noticed the, the, the issue, why do I keep two empty blocks hanging around? Uh, that's to avoid this situation where you flip-flop. So I have a completely uh, a brutish array stack where all the blocks are full. So now I add something. That allocates a new block, and the new thing that I added goes there. And now in the next, the very next operation, I remove something, which means that this block becomes empty. And if I'm aggressive with trying to, if I'm too aggressive with trying to save space, then I would deallocate this block, because it's completely empty. But now you see the problem. I just allocated it because of an insertion. One operation later, I deallocated it because of a removal. And now if I do another insertion, it's going to come back again. Okay. So allowing for two empty blocks, uh, or two blocks that are nearly empty, um, one that's completely empty and one that's, that's nearly empty, gives you this buffer so that you're not constantly creating an array, getting rid of it, creating an array, getting rid of it. If I create an array of length r, then there's going to be something like r minus 1 extra add operations before I have to create a new one, or there's going to be r minus 1 remove operations before I have to remove the one that I just created. Okay. Um, and so that's why this, this is uh, here. Uh, you could add a, another furthermore that says furthermore, the cost of uh, the total running time of grow and shrink operations 
on any sequence of uh, add and remove operations is only proportional to the number of add and remove operations. We've, we've seen several statements like that there. Okay. Um, good. Uh, so that's, uh, that's it for, uh, for the lecture. Um, Hydro Auto is going to cut my power in about half an hour. If uh, I have a, you know, I can spend five minutes or so ask, answering questions if anybody is uh, interested. Do you need this for A1? Not at all. Assignment 1 is only uh, using the basic classes in the Java Collections framework. So the implementations of the lists, uh, sets, uh, and sorted sets that we have uh, we've seen in the Java Collections framework. So assignment 1 is about using data structures Assignments 2 and subsequent ones will actually have you creating data structures. Uh, regarding the midterm, yes, I will give you a sample midterm that uh, resembles very closely in terms of structure and content to the actual midterm. Um, we'll do that a little bit closer to the, the midterm date. Okay, so I will uh, sign off now. Uh, thanks for showing up at the weird time. It's always good to have a few people um, watching, uh, to have some, some feeling that I'm teaching to people. I'm not just a, a camera. So uh, see you Friday.